We want to go to the Lord in prayer tonight, and then we're going to potentially uh, sew up our study on the gifts of the Spirit this evening, which, if I have counted correctly, I believe would mean that it's been about 13 or 14 sessions to do this entire series. I hope we've done justice to it. I hope it's been a blessing and has educated and inspired folks. I hope it's made you hungry to seek God and ask Him to use you in the areas of the gifts of the Spirit. Um, but let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and then we'll sew this up, okay? Master, we love you, God, and we thank you as always for every opportunity we have to come together as the people of God. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Master, tonight, oh God, we always need the anointing, the presence of God. If we are to receive from your Word that which you would have us to receive, we need the Spirit of God to anoint Lord, allowing the hearer to know that that which they hear is not doctrines of men, it is not ideas contrived by councils, but it is in fact and indeed the word of the Lord. Master, touch our hearing, touch our hearts, cultivate the ground today in our minds and in our spirits that we might receive the word of the Lord today with gladness. Help me, Lord, as the teacher to impart to those that listen the word of God. Help us, Lord, today to say that which needs to be said, to remain silent where we ought to remain silent. Master, we ask all this today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We, for the last few weeks, uh, we actually spent a good deal of time on the topic of prophecy. We talked about the, what prophecy is. Um, in a nutshell, it is proclaiming, declaring, thus saith the Lord. Speaking <coughs> for God, <coughs> excuse me, in the first person. And it is uh, probably the most valuable gift that is offered to the church, which is why the Apostle Paul said that above all else, we ought to desire and seek that the Lord might use us in prophecy. It is that important and that powerful a tool for God to communicate directly with his church. Uh, we've talked about uh, the nature of false prophecy. We have talked about the fact that prophecy is a gift that operates uh, in dual fashion. It is a gift that operates at times um, uh, as an occasional anointing or an occasional gift. In other words, the Lord occasionally can touch someone and cause them to prophesy. But then by the same token, prophecy is the only gift that also can be uh, imparted with an office so that an individual actually possesses a prophetic ministry uh, that makes them technically a prophet, okay? Um, I hate titles. I, I have no use in the universe for titles. So um, when I tell people the Lord called me to a prophetic ministry, uh, that is exactly what I mean. I, I, I have no use for titles at all. Titles, in my mind anyway, um, are used by people to elevate themselves and used by people to pad their egos and to, you know, kind of puff up their pride a little bit. I don't need a title to do that. God called me to do what I do, and I do what I do. Amen. And, uh, you know, I've gone into churches by the absolute dozens and dozens and dozens and preached a message and had the pastor come after I was done and say, surely God sent us a prophet tonight because this man's never met us. He doesn't know us. He doesn't know anything about our church. And yet he preached something that was 
uh, surgical. That was so necessary, not to the church in general so much as to our specific congregation. And the, the Lord has often used me to go in and literally perform spiritual surgery in churches. And and I'm doing I don't know a thing in the world about that church. And yet the Lord will give me a message, and in the process of delivering the message, I'm saying things that the pastor later tells me, brother, you just have no idea in the universe. You everything you said, it was like every word you spoke were things that this congregation specifically needed, absolutely needed to hear. And um, um, so, you know, a, a ministry, a man or a woman's ministry speaks for itself. You don't need title. If you need a title to tell somebody that you have a prophetic ministry, then you have a pretty poor prophetic ministry, okay? Um, no, your anointing, the ministry that God has given you speaks for itself, okay? So for me anyway, I'm not big on titles. All right, we then talked about uh, prophecy as it is represented in the New Testament and how God used prophecy in the New Testament. We talked about how um, uh, the promise of God for the last days is that our sons and daughters shall prophesy. So, you know, all of those things we covered in the last few weeks as part of this particular study. Tonight, we want to look in closing, we want to look at uh, the gifts of healings, okay? This is going to be the gift that we will sew up this study with. We want to look at uh, the issue of healing. Uh, it is a gift that God has uh, imparted to the church. What cracks me up is, again, a lot of you who know me know, I don't have time for false teaching and false doctrine in some of these dopey churches. Uh, I don't have time for foolishness in the Baptist church and what have you. Uh, they talk about, you know, I, I ain't never known anybody had the gift of healing. First of all, that's not the gift. That's not what it's called. The Apostle Paul said the gifts of healings. So what does that tell you? Well, that means that healing, like prophecy, has multiple manifestations, that this gift has multiple manifestations. There are some people that God may operate through and heal uh, through them. For instance, at the beginning of the 20th century, one of the great men of God who uh, received the Holy Ghost at the turn of the century, Brother Smith Wigglesworth out of the UK. Um, Brother Wigglesworth received the Holy Ghost and began to preach the Pentecostal message, even though till the day he died, he was part of the Salvation Army uh, organization, believe it or not. And uh, Brother, Wiggle, Brother uh, Smith Wigglesworth, the Lord used him in healing ministry. That man had a powerful, powerful um, healing ministry. Tens of thousands of people were healed in services that he conducted. And there are all kinds of documented miracles and healings which occurred uh, under his uh, ministry, um, they literally, people used to literally hire ambulances to carry their loved ones who were on their deathbeds to carry them to a Smith Wigglesworth service. And Brother Wigglesworth would go down the line and literally lay hands on and pray for these people one at a time. And there are all kinds of documented cases where people were healed and delivered from their deathbed uh, by the power of God under this man's, uh, the auspices of his ministry. So yes, there are people that the Lord um, will gift 
But see, the thing is, they're really, it, they're not gifted with healing. They're gifted with, there's another gift of the Spirit, if you recall, uh, that really is responsible for all these healings. If you remember in James chapter 5, the, uh, the Lord's brother said, Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders, elders of the church and let them anoint him with oil and pray, laying hands on them in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. So really what happens is it's not that God gives anybody the ability to just go out and heal so much as God endows them with the gift of, anybody want to take a guess at it? Gift of faith. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. So when the word of God says the gifts of healings, again, that's not speaking necessarily of God giving somebody, you know, oh, they can just go out and heal anybody they want to heal. No, but he gives them the faith to pray the prayer of faith over those who are sick. Do you follow what I'm saying? All right. However, healing uh, is manifested in a number of ways. And this is why you have the plurality in the language of the gifts of healing. It's plural, because healing manifests itself in a number of ways. Even when the Lord was ministering on the earth, even during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, the Word of God tells us that even then the apostles were already anointing people with oil, and they were being healed. So the practice of anointing with oil and seeing healings transpire actually began even with the apostles, okay? Uh, while Jesus was still living and ministering as a man. Um, and then, of course, we're told in the New Testament church that this is something we can do. So this is one way that God heals in response to the anointing with oil coupled with praying the prayer of faith. Then there are instances where people are healed simply through the laying on of hands. Now, mind you, listen carefully to what I'm about to say. A lot of people, for some reason, a lot of people in the church just don't get some of this. Nowhere does it say that they're going to have to lay hands on you and pray for you. Jesus said in Mark, the last chapter of Mark, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall lay hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. Okay? So it's not altogether necessary per se that an individual even pray for you. Okay? Um, you can receive your healing simply through the laying on of hands, period. And uh, so that's another manifestation of healing. The Bible said that uh, the power of God was so heavily upon the Apostle Peter that people used to lie in the streets just hoping his shadow would pass over them, okay? So again, miracles occurred, healings occurred just because his shadow passed over them. Um, so healings are manifested in a variety of ways, in a number of ways, okay? And uh, so it's important to understand that if you need a miracle from God, honey, you don't need to run to Benny Hinn. Now, I was a, a fan, I, I guess you might say, of Tammy Faye Baker. I'm going to be honest. I love Tammy Faye. That lady had the sweetest spirit and the kindest heart. People sat in judgment of her. They criticized her. They tore her apart for decades, and it was sad. And even when I was in the holiness movement way back in the day, and I wasn't 
uh, proponent of women wearing makeup and jewelry and all this stuff. I still loved Tammy Faye back in that day, just like I loved um, Vestal Goodman, you know. Um, these were marvelous ladies. I don't care what they wore, or if they cut the hair, or how you know, or how they did the. They had the right spirit. They had the right attitude and the right spirit, and I adored them. Okay, and I was a big fan of Tammy Faye, and um, um, when she got sick with cancer, I kind of felt bad because she went to Benny Hinn hoping she could get her healing, you know. She thought, well, surely if anybody, you know, I'm going to get a healing anywhere. No, th see, there's the mistake. Now you're looking at Benny Hinn as the source rather than the conduit. And that's dangerous, okay? that We never want to do that. God is the source. I had a great aunt many years ago, uh, I heard her tell this testimony. I heard my grandfather tell this testimony. Uh, her sisters told this testimony. So I know it's true. My great aunt, many, many years ago, my grandfather's sister, um, had contracted a cancer in her stomach. This is going back, I think, to like the 1940s, if I remember correctly. And she had gotten a stomach cancer. And the stomach cancer literally ate through her stomach and literally ate through the flesh of her belly. She had a hole in her belly. The doctors had sent her home to die. This is back in the day. They didn't have all the chemo and all the treatments they have, you know, today, the um, uh radiation and all those sorts of things and the doctor had sent her home to die and one night her sister my aunt uh, Eleanor was sitting up with her and uh, my aunt Eleanor all of a sudden just I guess the Lord quickened something in her spirit and my aunt Eleanor looked at my aunt Geneva and said Geneva what on earth is wrong with us what is wrong with us? We're sitting here waiting for you to die. She said, my God, we serve a bigger God than that. And she said, you know what? Get something on. Put something on. We're going to go down to that little Pentecostal church down the road. Mind you, they were Pentecostal, but they didn't attend this particular church. They attended another church. She said, we're going to go down. They're having church down the street. She said, we're going to go into that church, and we're going to get you anointed with oil and prayed for. So my Aunt Geneva got dressed, and they walked a couple of blocks to this little church, and they went inside, and they told the... And there wasn't but a, a few dozen people there. It was a small church. And they put my Aunt Geneva on the altar, they sat her on the altar. They anointed her with all. They laid hands on her and prayed for her. And the next morning, my Aunt Geneva woke up, and she had to constantly change her dressing because her it would seep, you know, and it would just get all messy, and she'd have to change the dressing. Well, she pulled the dressing off to change the dressing, and her stomach was healed, literally healed overnight as if she had never had any kind of a sore there. And she called the doctor and told her doctor, I've been healed. And the doctor thought she'd lost her mind. He thought she finally flipped, that maybe the pressure of dying, you know, it kind of made her crack. So he told her, he said, well, Geneva, if you've been healed, then why don't you come in and let me see, you know? And she said, okay. Well, her husband was at work. So she walked to the doctor's office. It was like two miles. She walked to the doctor. And she walks in, and the doctor looks at her side. It's completely healed up. And he was mind blown, had no clue what to do or what to think. Uh, this in, in response to Oral Roberts, who was active back then in ministry, you know, his big healing ministry. No, this was a little tiny 
Pentecostal church that these ladies didn't even attend. But they knew how to pray the prayer of faith. My grandfather, when I was growing up as a kid, my grandfather, my mother's dad, bless his heart, I'm telling you, God healed that man so many times. The Lord healed him many, many times. And my grandfather loved to share the testimonies of his healings. He loved to tell the stories. And he'd tell them so many times. And as a kid, sometimes, you know, you kind of roll your eyes. And I'd look at Grandma. she look at me. she kind of roll her eyes like, oh, Lord, here we go again. But, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I am so grateful my grandfather told me those stories so many times. Because now if I live to be a thousand, I'll never forget those stories word for word because I heard them so many times. But my grandfather was out trying to chop down a tree one time, and he was uh, using an axe, a sharp axe, and he accidentally, something happened, and the axe head went right through his knee cap and tore his leg all up. And he wound up, they went, took him to the hospital, everything, of course, they had to, uh, you know, do all kind of wrapping it up and splints and everything else. And probably they figured he was going to need surgery and all this other stuff. But again, this is going back to like the 50s or something. And uh, my grandfather adored a preacher that you've heard me talk about a lot. If you know anything about our ministry, uh, Brother Tatlock, Warren Tatlock. And Brother Tatlock pastored a church up the road uh, a few towns from where my grandparents lived. And they attended it for quite a, quite a while. Uh, but then they started going to a church a little bit closer to their house at one point um, because Brother Tatlock's church was up the road quite a ways. And anyway, my grandfather had been to the shop doctor and the, showed the shop doctor what had happened, you know. And the shop doctor told him, said, Don, you're, you're going to be out of work for months, man. You're not going to be able to work for months. My grandfather worked in a factory, a uniroll factory, which was a rubber, a vulcanized rubber plant, you know, uh, where they made uh, rubber. And uh, it was a chemical plant. And anyhow, so um, my grandfather, here he was, you know, he's, he's got 10 children. And he's looking at being out of work for months, and this was going to create a huge hardship and difficulty for them. And so he asked a neighbor, uh, a man named Royal uh, Murdoch, uh, and he asked Royal, he said, Royal, by any chance could you drive me over to uh, Brother Tatlock's house in, in Wolken? And uh, the neighbor said, well, sure, Don, I'll take you up there. So Royal Murdoch drove my grandfather up there, and they knocked on the door. And it was kind of getting a little late. It was like 8 o'clock or 8.30 in the evening. And brother and sister Tatlock were actually kind of getting ready for bed. And they used to have a little tradition where they would sit and have tea and uh, cookies before they'd go to bed. They'd always kind of have this little snack, you know, tea and cookies. These folks were from Canada. And uh, people from Maine and Canada, if you're from that part of the world, you kind of understand these little traditions because it warms you up and gets you ready for a cold night, you know. And anyhow, uh, Sister Tatlock, bless her heart, she had her hair and curlers or whatever and had a, a thing over it, you know, and uh, wearing a robe and, you know, and Brother Tatlock's the same way. And they invited my grandpa and Royal in, and they came in, and they all sat there, and they're having uh, tea and, and uh, cookies. And uh, my grandfather said that he told, you know, Brother Talon what had happened, and he said, I, I'm hoping you'll pray for me, you know. Well, anyway, they were sitting there talking and just talking, and all of a sudden, <laughs> he said, all of a sudden, Brother Talon just reached over and grabbed hold of Oh, grabbed hold of my grandfather's knee. And he said something so simple. He said, Lord, this man's got a family to support. He said he can't have this 
knee like this. He said, Jesus, heal him, God, right now, in Jesus' name. And my grandfather said, when Brother Tatlock said that, he said he pulled his knee up, bent it. He said, and pulled my legs up. He said, and I pushed up under the table. And we sat there and we finished our visit. And he said, the next day I went back to the shop doctor and I told the shop doctor, you're not going to believe this when you see this. And the shop doctor said, what is it? He said, uh, God healed me. The Lord healed me. And uh, of course, the shop doctor, you know, after seeing the extent of his injury, he said, oh, really? You know, and he looked at it. He examined it. He said, my God, Don, I've never seen anything like it in my life. He had been completely healed in a matter of seconds, just like that. Was it some big name preacher or old Roberts? Was it, you know, was it Benny Hinn? Was it one of these quacks on television who make a dog and pony show out of things like this? No, it was a little old preacher who pastored a church with 120, 130 people. But Brother Tatlock had faith. Man, I'll tell you one thing. That man was a man of faith. So the point I'm trying to make is, you know, healing manifests itself in a variety of ways, okay? And so the gift is not so much something that God gives to individuals where healing is concerned. No, the gift is the healings. That's the gift, okay? Um, so it's not a matter of uh, somebody having the gift of healing so much as us receiving a gift of healing, okay? And uh, there are many examples, obviously, throughout the Word of God of uh, the gifts of healing and operation in the New Testament church. Now, I'm talking about post Jesus. In other words, I'm not talking about miracles that occurred um, by the, lo the Lord healing people. No, no, no. I'm talking about miracles that occurred after the Lord had ascended and God was healing through the church. He said in Mark, you know, these signs shall follow them. And there are a number of examples there is the lame beggar who was healed in Acts 3, verses 1 through 10. And uh, let me see here. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. <clears throat> but Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were all filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. In Acts 5, verses 12 through 16, we read of there being many signs and wonders done uh, by the apostles and the early church. The word of God saying, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets. 
and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Philip is said to have uh, had healings occur under his ministry as he preached in Samaria in Acts uh, 8, 4 through 8. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. When uh, the apostle Paul, who was known as Saul, was converted, he needed a healing because he was struck blind in Acts 9, 17 through 19. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Okay, now mind you in that instance, did Ananias pray? No. He laid hands on Paul, Saul, and made a declaration. He said, Jesus, who you met on the road to Damascus, sent me here that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what he said. That's not a prayer. Ain't no prayer in that. No, but he laid his hands on him and Paul, and immediately it said that as if scales, you know, had covered his eyes, his eye, his sight returned. There was the healing of uh, Aeneas in Acts 9, 32 through 35. Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. Again, is there a prayer prayed here? No. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. <clears throat> there was an incident at Lystra, and the Apostle Paul again was touched by the Lord in Acts 14, 8 through 10. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. Um, or I'm sorry, no, no, not Paul. Um, Paul was involved in the healing. Anyway, there was a man who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand up right on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. Was there a prayer prayed? No, there was not. Was there hands laid? No, there was not. So you see, this is why it says the gifts of healings, because healing comes in so many different forms, comes in so many different ways, okay? Uh, and the gift is the actual healing. Paul, this is what I was actually referring to a moment ago. I made a mistake. At Lystra, Paul was stoned, and uh, it was presumed they thought he was dead. Um, Acts 14, 19 through 23, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. Um, 
So there again, they thought he was dead. They stoned him. They thought he was dead. They dragged him out to the outside of the city and left him for dead. The apostles, excuse me, the believers got around him and prayed. And next thing you know, he's standing up. Now, I'm going to give you an example. This, I know for a fact, this happened in a church I used to preach in. Uh, friends of mine pastored a church in a little town called Shamrock, Texas and uh, brother and sister Bruce, and they had a man in their church who uh, fell to the floor dead. And sister Julie Maston, who is a uh, nurse and had been a nurse for many years, she, of course, went down and began to check his pulse and look, and she said, she looked up sister uh, Bruce and said, my God, this man's dead. And uh, sister, sister Bruce, I can tell you, I used to talk about... I'm telling you, I've known some great people of faith in my life. And Sister Bruce said, let's get around him. And they got around. They didn't call for an ambulance. They didn't go immediately running for an ambulance. The church people got around him, and they started to pray. And Sister Bruce leaned over, and she grabbed him by the hand. She said, in the name of Jesus, get up. She said, all of a sudden, that guy leaped up to his feet. So see, I'm telling you folks, God's a healer. God's a miracle worker. This is what God wants to do in the church. This is what the Lord's wanted to do in the church since day one. This is what God wants to do in our church right here in Huntsville. This is what he wanted to do in Dallas, but the people wouldn't get behind it. But if we get behind it in Huntsville, this is what God's going to do. And you're going to see miracles like this. I've seen them with my own eyes. I've been there. I've experienced it. I know that God can. I know that God will. And I know that God wants to. Of course, there's the story... Um, of the sons of Sceva in Acts 19, 11 through 20. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Is this because Paul was so perfect and so holy that he could walk on water? No, no, this has to do with faith. This has to do with anointing. This has to do with relationship uh, with the Lord. And the power of God was so real in Paul's life that even something that touched him could be sent to the sick and they'd be healed. This is why we have the practice of what we refer to as uh, prayer cloths, okay? Uh, we'll take a, a cloth and we'll anoint it with oil and we'll pray over it and we'll send it to the saint. Basically, it's based on this same principle of what um, they experienced with Paul. You know, they would just take something that uh, he had touched. We're just putting a little extra oomph behind it by praying over it. I was healed in 2000, supposed to die in a hospital. Uh, family was told I'd be dead inside 24 hours. And that went on for a month. I was supposed to be dead within 24 hours. A church pastored by an LGBT preacher like myself, a good friend of mine, a wonderful fellow, Brother Ronnie Pig. Uh, Brother Ronnie and his church prayed over a hanky. They anointed it with all. They sent it to me overnight via Federal Express. And when I received it, I reached in the envelope. My mother had to open the envelope because I was too weak to open a Federal Express envelope. I was, all, I was fully intubated. And I reached in and I knew the minute I touched that cloth, I knew what it was. I said, these people have sent a prayer cloth. And in my mind, I couldn't speak because I had tubes down my throat. But in my mind, I said, okay, Lord, these people are believing you for a miracle. If they're believing you for a miracle, I'm believing you for a miracle. I said, I'm not going to make you look like a liar. I said, uh, let's get it done. That was my exact thought. Let's get it done. The next day, I came off life support after being on life support for a month. I'm here to tell you, folks, God still performs miracles. Jesus still heals. And so... Um, there's the example of Eutychus being raised from the dead in Acts chapter 20. 
verses 7 through 16. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. He was long-winded. He went on and on and on. And there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. That ought to teach some of y'all not to go to sleep while the preacher's preaching, all right? And... Uh, and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. So uh, Paul said to them, don't worry, he's going to be all right. So they left the kid and lo and behold, he, he was alive. He was still well. All right, Paul at Malta in Acts 28, 1 through 9. Uh, there was um, the incident of Paul being uh, struck by a serpent. And of course, he had no harm, he had no injury. He shocked everybody in his party. They were all looking at him like, what on earth happened? This man should be dead. But the word of God said, the signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall, lay hand, uh, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. That doesn't mean we ought to run around doing these things as a test of our faith. But if uh, the occasion arises and something happens uh, where this sort of thing is concerned, according to the promise of God's word, we'll be well. And, uh, and lo and behold, that's what happened with Paul. All right, so I'm trying to kind of move quickly because I want to make sure tonight we can get through, you know, and go ahead and finish this study. So there are a number of examples of healings that occurred long after the Lord had ascended. And these things occurred through and with the apostles and the early church. And, uh, and you see how that there's a variety of ways that the healings came. In some instances, it was just a matter of uh, being told, you know, uh, something. And they just said something to the person. In some instances, they laid hands on them. In some instances, they didn't lay hands on them. In some instances, they just took an article of clothing or a piece of cloth from the person and brought it to the sick, and the sick were healed. So there are any numbers of ways that God heals. Healing is the gift that God gives to the church, to the individual in need of the healing. We, we often... We often make the mistake of saying that an individual has the gift of healing. That is not the gift. That is not what the Word of God says. No, a person can have the gift of faith. And if they have the gift of faith, obviously they're able then to tap into healing for people because they're able to pray the prayer of faith. However, you also have to understand, if God, could, if God simply gave somebody the gift of healing, they could just walk into hospitals and heal everybody and, you know, and walk out. People don't understand that um, miracles of this sort operate in the realms of faith. Faith is God's currency, okay? Uh, that is what we exchange for healing and for miracles. We exchange our faith. If you notice in the one example that I gave you, the Word of God said how that Paul looked on this man, and he perceived, you know what? That guy's got the faith to believe for a miracle. He's, I can see the faith. I can just see his faith, you know? And then what did he do? Did he pray for him? Did he lay hand? No, he just ordered him, stand up, get up. 
And that man had faith, and boom, he jumped up, you see? And so um, a lot of times this happens, you know, um, if a preacher's full of the Holy Ghost and has discernment of spirits and has uh, any sense of sensitivity to things of God, there are times when uh, uh, the Spirit of the Lord will speak to me. I've had this happen any number of times. I, I couldn't even count how many times the Spirit of the Lord would speak to me and say, just go lay hands on that person. And I don't know what their problem is. I don't know what what is. I don't know nothing about it. All I know is the Lord said, go lay hands on them. Okay? And I'll go over and lay hands on them. I, I don't know what to pray because I, I, there's what can I pray? I don't know what the problem is. All I say is in the name of Jesus, and I lay hands on them. That's all I say. And all of a sudden, that person just throws their hands up in the air, starts speaking in tongues. They receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. See, God knew they had the faith at that exact moment they were ready to receive the Holy Ghost. And the Lord at the exact moment just turns around and says, Okay, this is their, this is their time. Go lay hands on them. And I go up and lay hands on them. Boom, they receive the Holy Ghost. Had this happen one night. Uh, Sister Bruce, the lady I was talking about a few minutes ago, before she and her husband went up to Shamrock to pastor the church there, I lived with them for a little while. And uh, they had a son and a daughter. Um, they were really almost like an adopted family. This is when I went to Texas at the age of 16. Uh, I only lived with them for about a month before they went to Shamrock. But anyway, Sister Bruce was an incredible preacher. That little, that lady could preach. And I, and I mean, God used her like you can't even believe. And she would be invited to preach because in the Church of God, women preach. And uh, one time she was invited to preach in a church and it was actually on my birthday. It was on my 17th birthday. And she said, Chuck, I'm so sorry. It's going to be your birthday, but I need to go preach, you know, at this church. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. I'm happy to go, you know. And I went with her. And while she was preaching, she was preaching. The Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, go lay hands on this lady over here, sitting over here. I got up from my pew. I went over. I laid hands on this lady while Sister Bruce was preaching. And that lady threw her hands up in the air and just started speaking in tongues. She had received the gift of the Holy Ghost. She was ready. God knew it, you see. And the uh, same things happen with healings. I've had the same thing happen uh, with the Lord speaking to me to go lay hands on somebody. I, one time at the Riverside Church of God, again, those of you who know me know that Riverside is one of my greatest uh, uh, experiences in life. Uh, that was a Church of God church in Fort Worth, Texas, that I became a part of when I um, obeyed the Lord at 16 years old and moved to Fort Worth, Texas. Um, from Connecticut, where I'm from originally. And um, I was at Riverside, and Sister uh, Barbara Prince, who was Brother Gillum, the pastor's daughter. Now, she is a, he was an older man, so she was in her probably, uh, uh, probably late 40s, maybe early 50s at that point. And I always had a soft spot in my heart for this lady. I don't know what it was. There was something about her that I absolutely loved. I adored her. She had such a precious spirit about her, and I just adored her. Well, this one Sunday, she was up singing a special in church, and she was singing, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me. See, folks, I'm going to tell you, God, God does things the way he does things for a reason. There is a reason the Lord... You know, some of you folks that don't understand Holy Ghost-filled, Spirit-filled church, you know, you're listening and you're being critical. Say, well, I, God wouldn't tell somebody to do that. God ain't going to tell somebody to get up in the middle of church service and do that. The Lord knows what he's doing, trust me. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, get up and go lay hands on Barbara. And I'm like, Lord, you got to be kidding. She's up there in front of the church singing a special. I'm just going to walk up there. Now, at Riverside Church of God, if you were operating, you know, if you were under the direction of the Holy Ghost, ain't nobody there going to care. Not one person there was going to 
have a problem with me doing that if, you know. But I was new to the church. I hadn't been there real long, and I felt uncomfortable. And I kept wrestling with the Lord about going and doing it. And finally, I said, Lord, I can't, I can't. I said, Lord, just talk to somebody else, tell somebody else to do it. And I kid you not, I no sooner did I say, tell somebody else, tell somebody else to do it. Brother Gillum stood up, walked up, because he always sat on the front pew watching when people would sing specials. He'd come down off the pulpit, you know, and sit on the front pew. He got up, he walked up to her, laid his hands on his daughter's head. She went down to the floor like a sack of potatoes. And a couple of weeks later, she testified she had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Sister Gillum had been, di her mother had been diagnosed way back in the 40s or 50s with breast cancer and God healed her way back then. But Barbara had been diagnosed with breast cancer and they were wanting to do a radical mastectomy. And she said, I hadn't even told my parents. I hadn't told my mother. She said, no one what my mother went through years ago and of course the Lord healed her but I, she said I, I was just not ready to tell them yet um, because I didn't want to worry them and everything you know she said and then lo and behold she said dad got up and come up while I was singing and laid hands on me she said well I went back to the doctor they, they were trying to chart everything so they could go in and do the surgery, she said, they couldn't find it. It was gone. It was completely removed from her body. She said there was no scar tissue. There was no evidence that it had ever been there. And everybody in the church saw Brother Gillum go up and lay hands on her without even knowing. Do you follow what I'm saying? You see why God wanted to do it that way? Because that way you knew it was God. You knew God had performed a miracle that he was operating in a sovereign manner, you know. So when the Lord tells somebody, get up and do something like that, it, there's a reason why he's doing it that way. He's, he was making a public display of her being prayed for. In other words, she could have been prayed for privately and nobody would have known any different, you know. But here she was, Brother Gillum didn't even know what was wrong with her. But here he gets up, goes up, lays hands on her, and she falls to the floor under the power of God. And lo and behold, she's been healed to breast cancer. And they no longer have to do any kind of a mastectomy, okay? So um, I've seen folks, I'm telling you, I've seen so many healings. If I were to try to stand here and, and share... Um, testimonies of healings I'd be talking all day and all night till a month from Tuesday and I mean literally I would I've seen God heal people I've seen people stand up out of wheelchairs who couldn't walk uh, I've seen people um, a, a young girl in the church I was born and raised in was in a diving accident and broke her neck the doctors said she would never walk she'd be paralyzed from the uh, you know the neck down and uh, she said, oh, no, I won't. She said, Ruthie was her name. And that little girl, that woman, uh, she at the time, she I think she was a teenager at the time, maybe like 14 or 15 or something. And she said, oh, no, I won't. She said, I'm going to walk again. You watch me. I'm going to walk again. And, uh, and I watched her walk down the aisle of our church. So I'm telling you, I've seen God do some wonderful things, and I've been on the receiving end of many, many miracles in my day. I'm going to tell you, my grandfather uh, saw so many miracles in his life that it, it's just mind-boggling. And uh, i, I got to share this one little story, talking about the Holy Ghost just again. Sometimes when conditions are perfect, you know, when everything's just right, the Lord will speak to you to do something, you know, in the way of laying on of hands. I was pastoring my first church many moons ago. This is back in like 84, 84, 1984. Yeah, I've been at it that long. And uh, uh, we were having a Bible study and a prayer meeting night, which was Tuesday night. 
And then on Thursday night, we used to have church. We used to have an evangelistic service on Thursday. We did Bible study and prayer meeting on Tuesday. Nowadays, we can't even get people to go to one service on Sunday and one service in the middle of the week. But back then, we did Tuesday night, Thursday night. We had Sunday school. We had church twice on Sunday, morning and evening. But anyway, it was Tuesday night, Bible study, prayer meeting. And there was a lady who had come to the church with a friend of hers asking for prayer. She needed not only healing in her body, but she needed deliverance from demonic oppression. And I laid hands on her, and the Lord slayed her, just laid her out on the floor. And the power of God was moving, and our people were in the altars, you know, praying. They originally had come down to help me pray for this lady, you know. But um, but the Lord laid her out, boy, and I mean, the people just prayed. I mean, there was such a spirit of intercession going, you know. And this one man in the church named Tom, as a matter of fact, he kind of fell to his knees, just literally just fell to his knees. And we had a cement uh, floor, just a, a, what do you call, you build a house on a slab. Just, it was a cement slab foundation, you know. And so all that was on that floor was tile. And then I put in the altar area, we used to roll out just some carpet. It wasn't padded or anything, you know, just carpet. So there was just that carpet there, but it wasn't cushioned or anything. And, and Tom was praying, he had his hands, but all of a sudden he fell down to his knees. And man, it's a miracle that that didn't crash his knees every kind of way. He was a little portly fella too. He wasn't a skinny little thing either. And he was just on his knees praying, and he had been seeking the Holy Ghost for a while. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Now go lay hands on him. I went over, I walked over, I laid my hands on him. I said, In the name of Jesus. That's all I said. And all of a sudden, that man's leg shot out underneath him, and he literally went, I mean, flying like something hit him like somebody whacked him with a bowling ball, and he went flying up in there. His, his legs went out from underneath him, and he was laying flat on his back, and he was speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave him the utterance. He received the Holy Ghost that night. So there, there's incidences where uh, if somebody is ready for a healing, you know, Paul looked at this man, and he saw that he had the faith to be healed. Well, sometimes the Lord knows, okay, this person has the faith to be healed. All they need, they need something. They need something in a sense to let them know, okay, God is on it right this minute. The Lord's doing it right now. And when you, because same thing with the Holy Ghost, they're ready for the Holy Ghost. All of a sudden, somebody comes, lays hands on them, and that just conveys to them without a word being spoken. Okay, honey, if you're ready, God's ready. Here it comes. And boom, you know, it happens. And so, um, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing when you're in a spirit-filled church and the gifts of the spirit are in operation and you see God doing these marvelous things through the gifts of the spirit, whether it be a word of knowledge, whether it be a word of wisdom, whether it be tongues with interpretation, whether it be prophecy, whether it be healing, whether it be deliverance from demons, whatever the case might be. When you see the gifts of the Spirit, and when you're part of a church where the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, folks, I'm here to tell you, you would never in your life ever are going to walk with God like you walk when you're in a church like that. Because God makes himself so real to you. You know God's real. I mean, you get to the point where, <laughs> where, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, you try to tell me God ain't real, honey, you're so late, it ain't even funny. You're wasting your breath on this old boy. God's, I've seen so many things in my lifetime. I've witnessed so many things. People say, oh, you know, you just believe it because you're raised in a church that preached that, and, you know, you're just brainwashed into believing that, you know. <laughs> yeah, right, right. No, no. Like anything, like anything, if, 
if I if if the church I grew up in, which was the Pentecostal church, preached this stuff, and I never saw any of it happen, don't you think at some point in my life I'd be thinking, ah, maybe this is bunk? <laughs> don't you think? At some point I might just question whether or not what they're preaching is real. Just like the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I received the Holy Ghost when I was a kid, for crying out loud. And it was as real as anything I've ever experienced in my life. You know, and so as, you, as you're in a church, this is why it's so imperative that the church of Jesus Christ, especially in these last days, be on fire for God, be full of the Holy Ghost, be operating in the Spirit. Because, honey, if our world has ever needed a church like this, we need it now. You know, there's an old song, if we've ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need Him now. We're in a country that Satan has deceived millions of Christians and he's got them off on a wild goose chase with all kinds of uh, political and social agenda items and they are so carnal and so worldly in their thinking. They're not doing the master's business. They're not doing God's business. And do you see what happens when the enemy gets us where we don't need to be? You don't see the miracles. You don't see the signs and wonders. You're not seeing the things happen that you ought to see happen. No, like I preach Sunday, you got to be in the deep water for these things to happen. You got to be where God wants you to be, not off and all this other foolishness, preaching politics, preaching the Republican Party, preaching Donald Trump. You know, uh, that kind of garbage, folks. Is going to prevent you from seeing the manifestation of the Holy Ghost and the power of God. The only way you're ever going to see the manifestation of the Holy Ghost and the power of God is by preaching Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. All right, we're almost at our the end of our time. I got to tell you today... I'm waiting on my healing. I've been, you know, Tommy will tell you, I went through an experience a few years ago where I wound up deaf in one ear. Uh, we had gone swimming. We had a little swimming party for, actually, I think it was Labor Day, wasn't it? It was. It was for Labor Day. So it was almost so many years. I can't remember how many years ago, but it's a pretty good while. And uh, I thought maybe I just had water in the ear or something, you know. And so I tried different treatments to try to clear out the water. And there were things you could buy at this pharmacy and everything. And I did everything I could do. And uh, days passed and it didn't clear. So I went to a church, uh, Pentecostal Straight, mainstream Pentecostal church near us and close to Dallas. Uh, the pastor there knew our church. He knew the nature of our church. And he welcomed us. He, we went in and fellowshiped at his church. He welcomed us. Uh, we didn't make a habit of it because I don't want to create a controversy for him, you know, and create a problem, which I'm not sure it did not anyway. But anyhow, um, but we would go occasionally and visit his church. So I went there and I asked them to anoint me all and pray. And they did. And they were disappointed that I didn't immediately, you know, get a healing. And because I was still deaf in that ear. And uh, I, t I told them, I said, no, 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 no. We've done our part. I said, no, all we got to do is wait on God. You know, folks, the Lord doesn't always do everything instant. There, sometimes there's a reason why the Lord kind of delays bringing the answer. And part of the problem some people have is they quit believing God during the time of delay. You can't do that. You got to keep believing God. Keep I don't care if years pass. You just keep believing the Lord and keep waiting on the Lord. And so anyhow, I told the church, I said, no, 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 no. The word of God said the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. I said, I won't get this healing. I'm just going to have to wait on it. So I went to a specialist, an ear specialist. And he told me they did all kinds of tests and stuff. And he looked in there 
He said, you have permanent nerve damage. He said, um, it happens a lot of times as people get older, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said, uh, we can fit you for a um, hearing aid and blah, blah, blah. But the, he said, the nerve gets damaged. And he said, that's what's happened with you. And it's permanent. And you'll, you'll never recover hearing in that ear, you know, normal hearing in that ear. And blah, blah, blah. And um, he said, there's one treatment that we can do. He said, it's painful. You got to cut three different times. He said, honestly, it has never, it's never helped in a situation like yours. He said, but if you want to do it, just so we can say we've done it, we can do it. And I don't know what on earth was going on in my head, but I, I decided, I said, well, okay, if you want to, you know. So I went through, I had to go like every two weeks for three different times, and they put a needle through your eardrum, and they pump some sort of a steroid in there. And I mean, who you talk about pain. I, my God, it felt like somebody was driving a nail through my head, you know. And I went for that treatment, and he told me, he said, honestly, with this type of, he said, I'm, I'm only doing this so we can say we've done it, okay? That's the only reason. And anyway, he did that and everything, and then um, time passed, and, you know, I had to go back and see him after a certain amount of time and everything. And when I went back to see him, I had told Tommy, I said, you know what, I said, called me crazy, but I think I'm getting hearing back because I could, at first when I blocked the opposite ear, I could hear nothing. I mean, literally nothing. And then I said, I'm hearing something through that other ear. I said, I wasn't sure how much I was hearing because honestly, by that point, I'd been stone deaf in that ear for like three, what was it, three or four months at least. And so all of a sudden, I'm hearing something, you know, so I wasn't sure how much I was hearing compared, you know. It's, it's funny, but when, you, when you're without hearing and then you start to hear something, you're not sure whether it's 20% or 50%, you know, or 50 or 100%. So anyway, I wound up going back to the ear specialist, and the ear specialist, um, I told him, I said, call me crazy. I said, but I'm, I'm hearing from that ear. And he says, really? I said, you know, and he, he put his finger on my ear like that, you know. And he started talking, and I repeated everything he said. And he said, you know what? I said, I'm on, I'm on, you're going to go do a hearing test. He said, I want to have you do a hearing test. So I had to go to this little booth, you know, and they play different tones, and you sit there for a while, and you listen, and you, you know. And I did the test. Well, when I come out of the test, the, the nurse told me, she said, the doctor had to go on an emergency. She said, so he's not going to be able to go over your results uh, with you. She said, but he'll call you and let you know what the results were. Well... He did call later, but I wasn't able to answer the phone at the moment. And he left a message that I played in our church at the time in Dallas. I played the message over the loudspeaker, the PA. And he literally said, well, hello, there's Superman. <laughs> and he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, you are at 90, what is it, 96% or 97% hearing in that ear. 97% restoration, folks. And uh, he said, I can't tell you how it happened. I can't tell you what happened. He said, but it, that is a miracle if I've ever seen a miracle. He was a Jewish doctor, too. So, you know, um, I, I've, I've seen any number of miracles in my day, and I thank God for that one because during the months that I was deaf in that ear, I'm telling you, preaching and singing in church and stuff, was so difficult. Oh, it's so hard to get used to being deaf in an ear. 
and I had to constantly try to turn a certain way where I could hear like the music playing, you know, so I could sing and everything. It was a nightmare. And um, oh, I kept praying. I said, Lord, please, Jesus, I can't, I can't live like this. This is horrible. And but God touched me and He healed me. And I've seen so many, many, many miracles in my day. And uh, if you're going to try to tell me God ain't real, well, you're a little too late. No. Uh, he said that he would reveal himself to us. And as you come into relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, especially if you're part of a good Holy Ghost filled, signs following, uh, gift operating church, I'm going to tell you something. God will make himself so real to you. <coughs> that no matter what struggle or trial you go through, you know, we all struggle with our faith at times. The enemy loves to convince us that, yeah, God's done this, God's done that, God's said, but he's not wanting to do this for you now. You know, this particular circumstance, he don't want to help you now. The enemy loves to come against our faith, and uh, that's part of why we go to church and we hear the preach word of God and this sort of thing, because a lot of times in the process of doing that, we put the, we put the enemy in his place. We get encouraged, you know, in our faith. And we say, all right, devil, you know what? Don't tell me God don't want to help me now. I believe he does want to help me, you know. He's not waiting on me to be perfect. He's not waiting on me to be sinless. He's not waiting on me to be able to walk on water before he'll help me in my current circumstance. And again, if the gifts are operating and everything, you may be the recipient of that miracle when somebody just comes over and lays hands on you, doesn't know nothing about nothing. And God says, all right, I'm ready now. I see you've got the faith, so I'm ready now. Praise God. Well, we are at the 8.30 mark. I told you we were going to try to um, close up our Bible studies from now on by 8.30. Uh, we have completed our study of the gifts of the Spirit. So now I'm going to have to do some praying and ask the Lord <laughs> to give me some direction as to what we're going to study next, you know, starting next Wednesday. I hope that these Bible studies have genuinely been a blessing and a help to you. I hope you're walking away with some inspiration if you're struggling with something, and I hope that you have hope. Um, I hope that you're believing God and you're expecting a miracle. Um, expect a miracle. Miracles happen. I expect, when I go to church every Sunday expecting uh, a church full of people to show up. I do. I literally do. I, 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 you know, that's one reason why I'm so disappointed when they don't. If I didn't genuinely believe that God was able to do it, I wouldn't go with such expectations. But I do. I go with great expectation because I've seen God do such things. Same thing with healing. I've got issues that I've been dealing with that are causing me a lot of consternation and a lot of aggravation right now. Uh, but I can tell you in truth that I honestly believe if we can get us a church going and if we can get some people together that love the Lord and uh, believe God for miracles, I'm expecting to get what I need. I'm expecting the Lord to touch me and, and I don't think I'm going to be in the same situation I'm in today forever, not by a million years. I, I'd like it to happen sooner than later. <laughs> I used to say that, remember, about the ear, the hearing thing. I said, Lord, I'm waiting on you for this ear. So I'd like it to be sooner than later. But uh, he wanted to confound some doctors. He wanted to shock some scientists. Um, and that's why he waited in that instance. And sometimes that's why he does it, folks. He, he, wants, he wants people to know for an absolute fact that he's done something miraculous when they've done everything science can do and nothing improves and then all of a sudden he just steps in and does something um i've seen let me tell you i've had doctors you can't believe how many times i've looked at a doctor 
and had a doctor look at me literally and say, I can't even begin to tell you what's happened. I can't even begin to explain what's going on. Uh, but it's because I serve a miracle working God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close tonight. Master, once again, God, we love you. We thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of healings which you bestow upon the people of God. We thank you, Lord, that on the cross of Calvary, you provided for our sin and for our offense toward you so that we might have eternal life. But, Master, according to the word of the Lord, by your stripes we are healed. And, Master, today we thank you for healing. We thank you, God, for the many, many times that you've touched our family members, our friends, our fellow church members, and even our own bodies. We give you glory always, Master. We share the testimonies so that you might be glorified in these things. Lord, you know our hearts today. You know, God, that uh, we've come to Huntsville we have come with a heart that is hungry and a deep desire to see a powerful, powerful, not, a, not some religious uh, church that plays church, but a powerful, Holy Ghost-empowered, Spirit-filled, gift-endowed church that is going to lift up the name of Jesus and cause people who sit in judgment, who criticize and condemn LGBT people. Lord, we want to be able to serve as an example, Lord, that you indeed do love and care about and respond to the prayers of all sincere believers, whatever their life situation, whatever their circumstance, whoever they may be. Because, Master, you operate in the realms of faith, and your grace is great enough to cover every individual on this planet. And it isn't grace that merely gets us to the altar, but, Lord, it's grace that's going to take us all the way home. Oh, Master, today help us to meditate upon that which we've heard tonight, Lord. Let us just uh, enjoy the thoughts of healing and victory. Help us to enjoy today, Lord, the reality of the gifts of the Spirit and help us to look forward to the day when this community has an LGBT-affirming, Spirit-filled church that is so empowered of the Holy Ghost that it is blowing the minds of those who sit in judgment and criticize. Help us to do the work, Lord, for the word of God declares, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that built it. Master, today in the name of Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. Praise God and amen.